to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. The cross of Christ is one of the single most important, is the single most important event in all of human history. But what Jesus said while He was up on the cross, those are some of the greatest statements that have ever been made. And friend, we're going to be thinking about those in the Scripture today. We're going to be studying about the seven statements of Jesus on the cross. And so I want to encourage you to find your Bible and have it ready as we're going to look at some very powerful statements of Jesus that He made in the midst of great anguish and suffering. We're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. We want you to know that today's lesson is being brought to you by individual members and congregations congregations of the Church of Christ. The Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by one of their assemblies, whether it be on Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday evening for Bible study. You would be an honored guest at any of their services. If you'd like to know more about the church or the plan of salvation or worship, you'll find people in the Lord's Church who'd be happy to discuss the scriptures with you, to sit down and open up the Bible and study God's Word. And so check out the Lord's Church in your local area. Friend, also at the Gospel of Christ here. We'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our class lessons, we'd be glad to make those available to you free of charge. You can contact us at the information given during this broadcast, or you can log on to our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can fill out a media request form. If you need a video, audio, written transcript, some of our study questions, we'd be glad to make those available available to you free of charge. And we want to encourage you in the fast-paced world in which we live to check out the Gospel of Christ app for both Android and Apple phones available on the Play Store. Today we're thinking about some of the most powerful statements that were ever made from the lips of Jesus while He was in the midst of great anguish and pain. And friend, as we introduce this idea, I want you to understand that these statements must have been very important for it would have been very difficult for Jesus to say much on the cross because of what He had suffered. Think about the beatings leading up to this. Jesus was slapped in the praetorium. Jesus had a crown of thorns placed on His head. He was flogged with a cat of nine tails beaten over and over again. A purple robe was placed on him. His hands and his feet were nailed uh, to a wooden cross, and he hung there in agony. And for, for every breath, Jesus would have to put pressure on the nails in his ankles to, to exhale. He had to put pressure on the nails in his hands. And so for every breath and every statement Jesus made, it was a great exertion of energy and pain. Thus, the things he said while he was on the cross had to be very important. What are those statements? Let's begin with the first. Jesus taught us while on the cross the power of forgiveness. Listen to the words of Luke chapter 23, verse number 34. Now imagine the scene. Again, Jesus is on the cross. His hands and His feet have been nailed to that cross. The very people who did that are some of the very people surrounding Him, likely there on Golgotha. And listen to what Jesus said. Luke 23, 34. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided His garments and cast lots. Luke chapter 23 Verse 34, if that were me, or if that were you, and we had unlimited power 
and the access to unlimited power, would you have said to the very people who just brought this suffering and anguish on you, Father, forgive them? We might say, Father, bring your justice on them. We might say, bring your wrath on them. We might wish some dreaded event would happen to them to repay evil for evil. But here we glimpse into the heart and the mission of Jesus. Why did Jesus come to this earth? For this very moment. Luke 19, 10. The Bible says, The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. On one account, Jesus would say, Should I pray, Father, deliver me from this? He said, No, that's the very reason I came to this earth. And so as Jesus looks down from that cross at the people on the hill of Golgotha there, his mindset, even in the midst of great anguish and pain, is forgiveness. Father, forgive them. Friend, doesn't that teach us and doesn't that remind us not only of the love and compassion and forgiveness of Christ, how much God wants us to be with Him, but doesn't it remind us of how we also ought to be a forgiving people. Love your enemy. Do good to those who, 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 who spitefully use you and, and mistreat you. Pray for them, Jesus would say in the Sermon on the Mount. Instead of getting angry and all worked up and holding grudges and, and wishing ill on other people when they do us wrong, I wonder how different the world would be if everybody had the mindset of Jesus. When I'm wronged, when I'm hurt, when people do things that are not right, can I look at the bigger picture and have the attitude that I hope they seek repentance and I hope they change their life and more than anything else, I want them to have the forgiveness of God? You know, that's kind of a reciprocal idea, isn't it? Don't you want to be forgiven? Don't you want to receive the mercy and the grace and the forgiveness of God? Haven't we all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3, verse 23. If I want God to forgive me, don't I also have to be forgiving to others? Matthew chapter 6, James chapter 2, a host of places in the Scripture which teach that's exactly the idea. And so when you think about Christ on the cross, not only do I want you to see His, His act of forgiveness in the offering of Himself, See his mindset on the cross of wanting God to forgive these people. The next statement that we see of Jesus on the cross is his, dire, his amazing love for the lost. We learn that Jesus was crucified with two thieves or two malefactors, two criminals. And at one point, both those criminals, the text will tell us, uh, the gospel will tell us, what, both those criminals reviled Him at one point. But evidently, one of them realized His dire predicament and that men don't come down from crosses and that, that His final moments on this earth are about to be lived. And He has a change of heart. And He says... Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And to that thief, we hear the love of Jesus for the lost. Luke 23, verse 43, Jesus said to that thief who, who prayed that Jesus would remember him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, understand, Jesus and this man are both living under the old covenant. Understand, according to Mark chapter 2, Jesus has power on earth to forgive sins. And this man, no doubt, had a heart change and he wanted to come back to God and he repented, no doubt of that. And Jesus said to that lost man today, even on the cross, even in the midst of great anguish and suffering, Jesus was saving people. Friend, think about the power of his salvation. Think about how this man must have felt in that dire predicament. And then think about what the cross of Jesus Christ does and represents today. Colossians 2, 14 and 15 and Ephesians 2, 14 and 15. The cross is where peace 
with God is made. Jesus made peace with that thief with God, and he makes it today for people as well. Now, we're not saying that the thief is an example necessarily of New Testament salvation, meaning what Paul or the disciples taught, uh, what the apostles taught you've got to do to be saved today. This is a unique scenario living under the Old Testament where this man is speaking directly to Jesus, but under the New Testament. Friend, the cross and the power of Jesus' salvation is just as powerful. Think about this, 50 days, after the cross of Jesus Christ. Men came, uh, the gospel is preached on Pentecost and they, they realize their sinfulness and they cry out, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter responds by saying, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the power of the cross is seen in the preaching of the gospel and every time somebody receives that salvation given by God by obedience to the gospel, friend, we can still see the power of Jesus in saving the lost. I want you to hear another statement of Christ made on the cross. Notice this one in John 19, verse number 26. Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. You know, when I think about things that Jesus said that are really impactful, Jesus knew it was his responsibility as a child to take care of his parents. Under the old law, the promise is, Honor your father and mother all the days of your life, and it will be well with you. Mark chapter 7 in the book of Deuteronomy clearly mentions that idea. Jesus wouldn't live long enough. He knew he was about to die. He wouldn't live long enough to fulfill that. But he made sure that promise was fulfilled. We see Jesus' respect for his mother and how we need to have respect for our loved ones today as well. We live in a world where there is a lot of disrespect today. People talk back to their parents, talk in such a disrespectful way to those who are older and those who are worthy of respect. The idea of taking care of someone in their old age, I wonder if that's something we think of much anymore. You see Jesus, great love for his mother on the cross when he says to the beloved disciple John, woman, behold your son, son, Behold your mother. These two were going to be like family now, and they were going to help and encourage one another along the way. The next statement we see of Jesus is that of him being the, the great bearer of the sins of the world. I want you to notice in your Bible, Mark chapter 15, verse number 34. The scripture records this for us. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If the cross wasn't bad enough, if the anguish and the pain and the shame and humiliation wasn't bad enough, Jesus bore our sins in his own body. 1 Peter 2, 24. And since God is of pure eyes that behold evil and cannot look upon wickedness, Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, he had to be forsaken for a time, short time, by the Father. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, God made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf. He bore our iniquities. He was, he was crushed for our iniquities. He bore our sins in His own body. Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 6. Jesus suffered something that had never happened before. He had closeness. He had oneness. He had an intimate relationship with the Father for all eternity. John 17, 3. And Jesus allowed that to be broken momentarily. He was forsaken for my sins and for yours. But I don't know that we understand the seriousness, the gravity, the expense Jesus went through so that I could be forgiven of sin. Imagine the people you love most in this life. And then imagine being cut off from them. Your wife, your children, your parents. 
having that relationship broken, even if momentarily. That would be terrible for us, right? And so when we think about all that Jesus suffered, Him bearing our sins in His own body and being forsaken, at least feeling that forsakenness of the Father, what a horrible suffering that in and of itself must have been. And then I want you to think about, as you think about the life of Christ and as you consider what He said on the cross, I want you to think about these two little words that show us His humanity and how bad it must have been. John 19, verse number 28, the Scripture records this for us. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the Scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. I thirst. Jesus felt His body succumbing to death, no doubt. The, 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 the blood loss, the, the anguish, the physical and mental exertion, and that thirsting that He felt, that reminds us of His humanity. I understand, as well as you do, that Jesus is God in the flesh. Matthew 1, verses 19 through 21. You'll call His name Jesus, which is translated God with us. But I also understand Jesus came in human form. He was born of a woman. He was born into this tabernacle, this fleshly house that our spirits live in today with all the, the pain, with all the weakness we feel, with all the hurt, with the hunger, the thirst, the, the grief, the sadness. John 11, verse 35, Jesus wept. Don't just focus. Here's what these words remind us of. Let's not just focus in on the deity of Jesus, His miracles, His power over Satan, His ability to do marvelous and great things because He was God. Let's also be reminded he was 100% human as well. 100% God, 100% human. And he felt the things I... This reminds us that when they took those iron stakes and they laid Jesus on that wooden cross and the point of that stake touched his skin and the hammer hit the nail head, there was a lot of pain involved in that. When Jesus hung in agony with his back already having been filleted by that whip embedded with nails and iron and, and glass and bones. Jesus' back on the cross really did hurt. And as Jesus' time draws near and you hear those words, I thirst, you can see the suffering vividly. See what Jesus suffered. My friend, I want to remind us of this. Why did he do that? Why, why did he go through all the pain? and the, Why did he come to this earth? Why go through the agony? Why go through the pain? Why go through the hurt? Why feel the thirst and the hunger? Listen to it again. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes we are healed. Jesus suffered in human form, not because of something He did, because of what I've done. This reminds us of the great love and humanity of Christ and the, and the greatness, the magnificence, the supremacy of His sacrifice and offering Himself as a sacrifice to Almighty God. And then there's this statement on the cross, the, the statement of great finality and fulfillment. Listen to John chapter 19. I want you to notice what Jesus says in verse number 30. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, He said, It is finished. And bowing His head, He gave up His spirit. You see, from the beginning of time, God had made a plan. 2 Timothy 1 verses 8 and 9 uh, 1 Peter 1, verses 11 through 16, He was foreordained before the foundations of the world, but He was manifest in these last days for us. Before God, before this first second on the clock of time ticked, and God even took the first piece of dirt and created man, put that into creation. God had a plan that His Son would come and die. 
That plan was the ultimate fulfillment of everything. And for Jesus to, to come to this earth, to face the temptation, the, the realness of suffering and sin and, and to endure everything Satan could throw at him. Don't you know there was a great sense of accomplishment, accomplishment on the cross when Jesus, in, in struggling to say anything, shouted out these words, It is finished! And with that statement, God's scheme of redemption no longer was a promise, no longer was a prophecy, became a reality. And because of what Jesus did, men and women could be saved. You know, friend, I not only am reminded of that, but I'm also reminded of the great a sense of accomplishment, the great sense of uh, feeling of accomplishment, knowing we've done what's right when we do the will of God. When I obey God and do what He tells me, there's a great sense of accomplishment knowing that the Father is happy with that, that God smiles down on His children today when they strive to live according to His will and do what God wants them to do. And so you see Jesus on the cross noting that fulfillment and the accomplishment therewith. Then let's look at this statement. Such a powerful statement. Luke chapter 23. I want you to notice with me verse number 46. Here we see the submission of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, He said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, He breathed His last. What do these words remind us of about Jesus? They remind us of His submissive spirit to the Father. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. From day one, Jesus would say, I've come not to do my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. As Jesus would be questioned by the Pharisees, as He would stand in the, in the halls of Pilate and be put on trial, He would over and over again say, I've not come to do my will, but the will of Him who sent me. And on the cross, he reminded us of His submission to the Father. Father, into Your hands I commit my spirit. Everything Jesus did in this life, He did to glorify and fulfill the will of the Father. And you can clearly see that in this final statement in Luke 23, verse 46. And friend, that reminds us of what Jesus' life was all about. It reminds us of the need for us to be submissive, and to find a purpose in this life, to glorify God. Do we have a type of spirit that is submissive, that we're willing to submit to God's will and do whatever God wants us to do? Friend, that, that's the mindset we've got to have if we're going to go to heaven, right? Matthew 7, verse 21, Jesus said, It's not everybody that looks up into heaven and says, Lord, Lord, that's going there. But he who does, he who submits himself to the will of God and does the will of the Father. And then, friend, I need to do that with a purpose in mind. I'm not here to have a claim for myself. I'm not here for rate. We're not here to, to be liked by other people. We're not here for our own glory. We've got to realize we're here to glorify God. Whether you eat or whether you drink, Whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. Solomon thought about life, and trust me, he tried it all. And he came to this grand conclusion. Let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. What's life all about? Fear God. Keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Friend, can I ask you to consider today your life in view of these statements? Jesus' forgiveness of all mankind, His love for lost people, His care and respect for His earthly mother, His desire to, 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 to suffer for all mankind and to ultimately die and put Himself in the hands of the Father. What about my life and yours? 
Are we being, are, are, are our lives being lived in such a way that we want to bring glory to God and ultimately live with Jesus one day? Friend, the people we remember in this life are not always the people with the most money, not always the people with the most friends, not always the people who've tried and experienced everything. The people we remember this life had great passion. And that passion came out in their words and their actions and the way they lived their life. And of course you can see that in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you're not a child of God, if you've never obeyed the gospel, we hope today that these statements will remind you how much Jesus loves you and that they'll push us toward obedience to God so that we can live a life that has real meaning and purpose. If you've never submitted to Jesus Christ in view of everything we've talked about today that Jesus did for me and you, won't you consider becoming a Christian today? You say, well, what's it mean to become a Christian? How do I do that? Friend, it's a life lived that brings glory to God and it starts by obedience to the gospel. Romans six seventeen says, God be thanked that you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered and they can be set free from sin. Have you obeyed the gospel? Do you believe Jesus is God's Son? John 8, verse 24, Jesus said, unless you believe that I'm He, you'll surely die in your sins. Would you turn from a life of sin to God in repentance? Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish, Luke 13, 5. Would you confess with your mouth, Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior of the world, Romans 10, verse 10, and to have every sin washed away and to get into Christ? Would you be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins? Here's what Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved, Mark 16, 16. Having been baptized, would you rise out of that watery grave to walk in newness of life every day. Romans chapter 6, verse 4. May God help each of us to learn more about Jesus and to live for Him each and every day. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, streaming, free media, and internet. Our motto is truly to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. This is the Gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call. 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the